We would be remiss if our symposium didn't include at least some discussion about the great city that is home to Columbia University, AGS, and the site of our symposium. New York happens to be a city that is already feeling the effects of climate change, is experiencing on a regular basis the hazards of many kinds, and is wondering how it is going to afford the resources to protect itself in the coming years. Our next two sessions bring to our stage a group of experts who know New York City. First off, we're pleased to welcome Mr. Alan Leidner, one of the founders of the New York City Geospatial Information Systems and Mapping Organization, Gizmo, which brings together GIS users from the New York City metropolitan area. Alan is gonna set the stage for our New York discussions by giving us a look at New York City's Enterprise GIS. Following Alan, Dr. Bill Selecki from the City University of New York has assembled a panel to talk about New York City on the front line of climate change. So Alan, why don't you lead us off? Thanks, John. Uh, just trying to figure out how I'm going to work this. Um, thank you very much for having me and for holding this event here in New York. I live 20 minutes away by walking, and it's uh, really uh, uh, very convenient for me to come here. Um, I'm, and it's advancing by itself, so I have to be terrified to say that Gizmo is the geospatial information uh, systems and mapping organization, which is the user group in New York City. Uh, we uh, are organized to advance the use of GIS in the city, and we work alongside the city of New York. Uh, here you see a selection of, uh, of our board members. And uh, if you're on the board of Gizmo, please stand, or a Gizmo member, just so people can see you. Thank you. And we also work with other organizations uh, across the country and locally. Uh, so we are just not a uni organization. We really feel like true GISers that you have to network. Um, now, let's see. This is going to be so one of the things that we advocated as Gizmo was the organization development of a um, uh, enterprise GIS system and the creation of a base map. And you can see some of the elements of that base map that was created between 1995 and 19. Uh, 90, 1996, 1999, and uh, when 9-11 occurred in New York City, we were extremely fortunate to have that map because it enabled us to form the Emergency Mapping and Data Center, uh, which was populated by a lot of Gizmo members because the city did not have a large GIS staff at the time, and we uh, were an organization with uh, several hundred members, and we were able to bring the community together for the development of 3,000 products that supported uh, the, G the community, the response community. Uh, coming out of 9-11, we understood that we had no information about the underground infrastructure, which played a critical role. So for the next 20 years, Wendy Dorf and I, I know Wendy's in the hall, uh, worked to encourage the city government to map the underground infrastructure of the city. Uh, finally, we reached out to, to Mike Reichardt uh, and the Open G, uh, GIS Consortium to develop uh, the MUDDY model. Um, after 20 years, we finally have the MUDDY model. And uh, then following that, we also work closely with New York University uh, with a $1.5 million NSF grant to actually map that model on New York City in a couple of pilot areas. And here you can see some of the conceptualizations of that. The underground is very complex. It has a problem in that you can't see through the pavement most of the times. Uh, and so we strove through the UNAM project uh, to develop uh, the muddy model in a way that could be implemented in New York. And uh, what that has resulted in, oddly enough, is that the UK was the first country to adopt the MUDDY model and the idea of mapping the underground infrastructure for the entire nation. We worked very closely with UK representatives in the Open Geospatial Consortium, and I'm happy to say, if you haven't heard it already, that New York City uh, has committed $10 million to the mapping of its underground infrastructure. So it took 20 years, but we we're finally able to do it. Uh, we also got involved in 
dealing with West Nile, which was a very disappointing uh, situation for us because GIS was not used to the extent it could. This image, uh, uh, which now disappeared, uh, shows uh, the kind of zip code mapping that was all too common during 9-11 and uh, mapping that was done in uh, um, an upstate county that granulized that data and show the patterns much more accurately. Uh, and we hope that the health community will realize that precision data is the only way to fight pandemics, just like Jon Snow realized that uh, well over 150 years ago. Um, oh, my last slide. So let me just go here as we continue to work you can see how desperate this is <laughs> as we continue to work uh, through Gizmo internationally with the Open Geospatial Consortium. We are now working on disaster pilot with OGC, one of the projects we recently worked on with, of all places, the province of Manitoba is the use of handheld um, mobile phones as citizen science instruments to collect information about if you're in distress or local conditions that warrant attention. Uh, the uh, smartphone is really becoming a sort of a Swiss army knife of applications so that you can adapt it for photos, for voice input, for sensors and everything we believe. And we prototyped the use of this uh, in Manitoba and we think it has a lot of uh, applicability to New York uh, when they pay attention to it and also uh, elsewhere, and Manitoba is uh, looking for funding to actually implement uh, this device for disaster uh, situations. And with that, I guess I'm done. So I didn't do too badly, all things considered, that I've never done it quite like this before. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks, Al. We warn everybody who's doing lightnings, they have no control on their slides. They're all done in the back automatically, so they better have their presentations down pat. So they, they all know that it's coming. Thank you, Alan. We appreciate your work with Gizmo, and AGS is always grateful for the support that Gizmo gives us throughout the year. And now our panel is going to continue our look at New York. Bill, welcome to you and your panel. Great. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. It's uh, you know, always good to sort of talk about New York. This is something that uh, myself and the panel have been working on for decades. And um, you know, one of the things that has been very influential in the process of understanding how the city of New York can respond to climate change, particularly in the realm of adaptation, is the generation of knowledge. We just heard in the, the, the other uh, session that just ended about um, you know, indigenous local knowledge, um, helping um, with respect to uh, uh, sea ice conditions, et cetera. But if you look at the literature uh, broadly on adaptation, there are three kind of key enabling conditions that people uh, talk about. One is governance and capacity, which New York has a, a fair bit of. Um, another one is financing, which is always an issue. And the third one is knowledge. And one of the things I think that's really important to sort of think about in the context of the, the, the city of New York is the capacity to generate knowledge and to understand the, uh, the risk of climate change um, and what that might mean in terms of the decision-making process uh, moving forward. So this, this particular panel is going to be sort of focused on that, that, that question. We have um, um, four, four panelists besides myself who are, who are working currently with the New York City Panel on Climate Change. I'm gonna talk a few minutes about that, a little bit of its history and how we, we came to be and, and, and the role that, that's played. But then we're gonna hear some very specific comments um, from Luis, um, particularly on the climate science, uh, from Sheila looking at issues of equity, um, Deborah uh, looking off into the future, uh, and some questions of transition, and then also Joel at the end as well. So, uh, what we're going to kind of start with is a little bit of a journey to sort of understand how the city of New York created this knowledge and, and what its implications have been. So the New York City Panel on Climate Change. So this was an idea that um, uh, was hatched, uh, I guess, almost 15, uh, 16 years ago, actually. If people might remember August of uh, 2007, early August, probably maybe not a particular memory, but there was this 
absolutely amazing rainstorm that occurred. Uh, maybe you were stuck in the subway that day. And this was sort of a light bulb moment for the city of New York because the city of New York recognizes that we have a dynamic climate, things, you know, we have, you know, major storms, we have other kinds of events. But one of the things that really alerted people that the possibility of climate change was this, this, this specific flooding event in early August of 2007. And basically what, it, what people said is, wow, we're, you know, we're used to getting this, the subways flooded maybe once every couple of years. This was the third time within a year that this happened. And this sort of spirited this, this idea of trying to develop you know, information that was specific to a city. And in some ways, this was really revolutionary because obviously we have the IPCC, which we, we borrowed the, the name a little bit from that, um, of course. And, but then also, it was something about downscaling, trying to provide local information and local knowledge. And what it tried to do is not just, at these early days, not talk about the climate science and what some of the changes that were going to be occurring, but what the impacts of those changes might be. And the particular focus, and I think this is a real testament to this current panel, NPCC4, is that they've been very effectively able to sort of spread out the agenda and to not just look at climate science with specifically the critical infrastructure, which was its early remit, but to a range of other questions that are critical to the city. So I think we have not only the panel itself, but the process has become more broad over time. And I think the other thing that's really quite striking in this is this was actually written into um, law, I mean, the, uh, as, a, uh, as a particular um, act that needs to take place to do an assessment every few years. Uh, and Jim Gennaros, who's uh, on the city council again, um, was sort of the, the, the major motivator for this sort of initiative, to create a public law about an assessment process. And we've had a series of assessments which have come out uh, over these last 15 years or so. And I just want to kind of highlight a little bit, it might be a little small in the back, I apologize, but recognizing that this has been a process of maturation, right? So the, uh, we've heard other people like Radley Horton earlier today, who's been you know, instrumental part of the New York City Panel on Climate Change, creating the science, creating that sort of image of the future, and, and through that creating some really um, iconographic maps of, of, of what the future might look like in terms of sea level rise, which have been very instrumental in sort of you know, motivating new policies and sort of understanding the implications for future, future climate shifts and the, and the implications for communities. Um, and so through those roots, illustrated by this graphic, you know, we've seen a spreading out of these uh, different sort of um, areas of focus to not only look at infrastructure, as I've mentioned, but increasing other, other dimensions of the daily life in the city, understanding the impacts of climate change on health, understanding the, the, the connection between the legal system and climate change, um, understanding uh, increasingly the question of equity. And I think one, one thing that's very clear from the literature as well, if we're going to have effective response and adaptation to climate change, it has to be embedded into and reflective of questions of equity and justice or else these programs simply won't be effective um, and or meaningful and, and promote uh, increased well-being. So I think that's an important takeaway, this idea of sort of the broadening out of this knowledge base that's occurred. There's also been a, a series of very, um, I think, in, important intellectual advances that the, IPC, that the NPCC, almost made a mistake there, NPCC has made. Um, and I think one of the most profound ones was one of these early um, uh, recognitions, and we already heard a little bit of borrowing. You know, New York always likes to sort of borrow from other places and decide that it did it first. I'm, an, I'm a native New Yorker, so I can guess. I, I guess I can say that, or anybody can say that, really. But the notion of is like New York always seems to say, "Well, we did this." But in truth, the, the notion of a flexible adaptation pathway, we kind of borrowed a little bit of this from the city of London, and then, but we sort of moved it forward in a very New York kind of way. And the recognition that as you start to sort of understand this dynamic nature of risk, at what point do you make interventions? And how do you make these interventions with respect to what is defined as an acceptable level of risk? So really managing climate change in the context of risk rather than you know, explicitly as hazard. And this was work that um, Robin, Robin Lashenko and Gary Yeo uh, spearheaded in NPCC1. Um, and really that then became a very fundamental and, and pivotal component of the ongoing national assessment. Gary Yeo was able to, to move that into sort of a national dialogue. So this idea of a flexible adaptation, 
to recognize that we need to sort of build in adaptation that, not, that doesn't sort of lock us into to specific structures but, and avoid maladaptation, but allows us to sort of build our response as our understanding of the impacts evolve as well. So these, these are some of the kind of the, the keystones uh, contributions, I would say, of the NPCC. And as I've said, um, you know, before I sort of uh, shift on to other, other speakers here to really give you the kind of the exciting cutting edge stuff, what's happening now, you know, we've had these three large scale reports all available for download uh, through the New York Academy of Sciences. Thank you if you're in the audience. Um, and these are real compendiums. So each one is a rather thick volume, um, you know, uh, heavily reviewed that looks at these questions of how the city or a city, but in this case, specifically the city of New York, can adapt to climate change. So we have our foundational uh, volume, NPCC1, which came out in 2010, which kind of, you know, is this opening salvo into this knowledge base. Um, the second one, uh, which was in 2015, really attempted to sort of, you know, further build up the knowledge base. So we have this sort of framing, we have that tree, if you remember back from a few slides, but then how do you really populate it? I'll, I'll push the analogy with additional leaves of knowledge. How about that? Um, you know, so that was really the objective of 2015. And then 2019 was really about tools and methods. You know, how do we, we heard some of the questions from the audience, what are the methods, what are the tools? So we really sort of honed in on that question and particularly things like evaluation, uh, metrics, tools to sort of understand how much progress we're making, right? So that was really kind of a major thread in 2019. We also contributed um, very, I think, meaningfully to the uh, Sandy recovery, which went on in the city of New York, just literally days after um, the event, we were talking with the mayor's office and, and they were saying, we need updated data, we need the latest so we can formulate an effective response. And this became part of the special report uh, that the city prepared and an initiative, which is still playing out today on how to make a more resilient city. Um, so that was really quite instrumental in, in the process as well. So these are sort of our, our set of slides uh, that sort of speak a little bit to the, the history of NPCC, and this final one sort of details um, you know, that, that sort of evolution over time. And I think with that, I'm gonna pass it to the, the, the that was the past, I'm the past, and, uh, and now we have the present, so, and also the future. So um, here we go. Thank you, Bill. I think you have to click. There we go. Yeah. There you go. Um, so that's actually a perfect uh, introduction to the the my remarks here today. Um, I'm going to be talking about uh, the climate science working group of the New York City Panel on Climate Change, uh, which has sort of a a unique place in uh, the panel and the reports that it puts out um, periodically because it not only does an assessment of the state of the climate science, um, what does the latest uh, literature tell us about what's gonna happen in cities or more specifically in New York even, uh, even the local or even global or regional drivers of these physical changes of the climate system, we also have a, a special task of developing what uh, I believe local law 42 calls the projections of record for the city of New York. Um, that it uses for all manner of investments, planning, um, uh, any, anything that requires uh, consideration of, of climate hazards. Uh, the city sort of uses information that comes from the NPCC. Um, and I'll, I will also remark that uh, the work that I'm presenting today is uh, uh, made possible by the contributions of uh, massive amount of experts, uh, some of them actually presented here earlier, including Dr. Horton, uh, who was in charge of the actual climate projections that I'm gonna be talking about today. Um, so with that, um, let's uh, move on into how the NPCC kind of frames or thinks about the future uh, and how we get to the projections uh, based on the information that we have. So th this is actually a graphic from NPCC2. Um, and it's well worn at this point because it's very effective, uh, but it, it's it's very good at showing our approach to uh, presenting projections uh, to the city. 
Um, we uh, take data from uh, Earth system models, what we generally call climate models uh, or global climate models, um, and which are in general sort of this, they're global in scale, but they're also very coarse because it's very computationally expensive to run very finely detailed global models. Uh, and the NPCC is tasked, or at least the Climate Science Working Group is tasked with um, bringing the data from all these models uh, that various groups around the world develop um, and uh, downscale them uh, to the city using statistical analyses, using uh, observations uh, from our local records, uh, from our weather station records, uh, for example, um, and bring those projections uh, to the city, so to speak, and downscale them uh, to the city to account for all the ways that the city's climate is a little bit different than the average climate is for a giant 100 by 100 kilometer box uh, around the New York City metro area. Um, and then the other key approach to our um, set of projections is that we take this sort of very large ensemble of models um, across various uh, emission scenarios, and we sort of um, create sort of what we call a, a large uh, or composite ensemble, uh, and we present a range of, of possibilities. Uh, we don't necessarily uh, prescribe uh, uh, probabilities to how likely these uh, projections might be, uh, but we present them under a, this is a more risky set of, uh, or more risk leading uh, set of projections. This is less risk. Um, and we sort of allow the sort of the risk tolerance, if you remember Bill's chart earlier today, uh, to sort of manage the part of, uh, of the adaptation. Um, and what you see here is we also sort of present this range in sort of two broad ranges. We sort of have the low, very low and very high range, which we represent in as uh, the 10th and the 90th percentile. You can think of all the models projections and um, taking sort of the lower end of all the models projections and the very, very high end. Uh, so the models that are uh, above, below which 90% of all the other models are, for example, those are very uh, uh, hot or, or very um, high end projections. Um, uh, and we sort of develop this sort of range rather than presenting just a, a single uh, middle of the road uh, projection that gives us sort of a, uh, the average of all the models. So since the beginning uh, of when the NPCC has been uh, presenting projections, this has been uh, sort of the approach that it's taken to sort of give a sort of a range uh, rather than just a very deterministic uh, set of projections. Um, and I'm gonna actually show um, uh, a few of the projections um, from the NPCC based around some of the extreme um, uh, and close to extreme uh, types of events uh, in New York City and, and just providing a very quick key uh, to interpret the graphs here uh, and how we sort of show that range. Um, we have the very light color uh, showing the very ends of, uh, of the range and the dark color showing the inner uh, sort of a middle of the road or the 50% central range of, of the projections. And we start with temperature um, or temperature related hazards. It's, um, I would say the clearest signal we, um, we see in, uh, from global climate change. Uh, as our climate grows warmer, it's more and more likely that we'll see warm and hot days uh, happen at higher frequencies or, or become even warmer. Uh, and what I'm showing here on the, uh, to your left is uh, the number of days uh, on a given year um, where temperatures might exceed 90 degrees Fahrenheit, which are what we call warm days. Uh, the gray dash line at the bottom is the baseline or what we see today uh, on average on any given year uh, based on the recent historical record. Um, and what we see is that um, basically for every uh, set of decades, uh, as we move from the left to the right, um, we uh, see very large increases in, in those very warm days. Um, in, in, even for the very near term in the 2030s, in that 30 year period, we see increases going as, as, as high as uh, uh, more than double. Uh, if you look at just at the sort of the near the center of those bars. Um, and then if we go towards the end of the century, uh, we see much, much uh, larger uh, multiples of increase from the baseline period um, throughout the, the ensemble of models. Uh, now, the story for very hot days, which we define as days above 95, is similar, uh, albeit 
a little bit smaller. These are kind of more extreme, so by that nature, less frequent. Um, but nonetheless, they're also more impactful, uh, so good to quantify. Uh, historically, we see about four, um, but very large potential increases or range of increases as we go towards the end of the century, um, sometimes by a multiple of, of 10, um, which is in part because our current baseline is pretty small, so a multiple of 10 is, is, is not that many more days, but it's still a very large increase. We then move on to uh, hazards related to precipitation, um, which uh, have a little bit more, more um, noisier signal um, uh, when related to increasing global temperatures. Um, our state of knowledge uh, about how global climate change impacts rainfall is uh, uh, not as strong as the, our state of knowledge that we have with, um, with um, temperatures, uh, and, and that bears out in our downscaled data. Um, you see that basically for all the projections for um, uh, all the time periods, we have um, at least the bottom edge of our projections range reaching uh, or, or touching our baseline period. Uh, but nevertheless, you see sort of if, if you kind of keep an eye on where the center of those bars are, there's maybe a little bit of a tick of increase uh, as you go towards um, the future, um, giving you a sense that perhaps um, Increases in uh, extreme precipitation days. Here I'm showing uh, one days with one inch precipitation and days with two inch precipitation on the right uh, might be um, uh, increasing, um, but not as such an um, extreme way as temperatures might be. Uh, but then again, we have very large uh, uncertainties around precipitation compared to um, uh, temperatures. Um, we have also worked on a variety of additional um, updates from previous uh, reports. Um, uh, one of them is uh, dealing with um, this issue that came up with the newest generation of climate models where some of them were more sensitive to carbon or um, uh, greenhouse gas emissions uh, than we think is likely. Um, and um, we did sort of bespoke analysis for the report to essentially show uh, that um, even though we do have some very small effect from what we call the so-called hot models uh, in the new uh, climate projections, um, the effects on New York City in particular are not statistically significant. Um, so the projections of record are still um, the projections of record. Um, we also updated our sea level rise projections um, based on our newest understanding of the physical drivers of sea level rise. Um, which um, is an update on, on some of the previous projections uh, that Bill was talking about. Um, and, and we also try to think a little bit forward uh, in what might be needed in future NPCCs. Uh, and one of the emerging topics has been on uh, drought, which uh, we haven't historically uh, looked at uh, in, in the panel, um, but um, we are getting signals that uh, uh, it's a very important topic, and it's very important to think about not just uh, over the city itself, but regionally, as it affects all the uh, food systems and, and other systems that rely on, on, on that water um, that the city draws on. Um, and uh, that's one of our recommendations now on, uh, on our key messages is to, uh, on future panels, to also include additional um, uh, or pay special attention to drought. Um, um, and not just from the point of view of, is it gonna rain less? Uh, but also from the point of view of uh, our, how is our demand for water changing and how does that interplay between the supply of water we have and the demand for uh, water we're going to have um, uh, going to affect drought conditions and, and water availability in the future. Um, so with that, I'll uh, leave it there and pass it over uh, to my colleague Sheila Foster. Great. Hi, I'm Sheila Foster, and I've been co-chairing the um, equity uh, work group, first with Robin Lachinko on MPCC3, um, and now with Ana Baptista of the New School on MPCC4. And when I was first asked to serve on the panel um, for MPCC3, there had not been a, a sustained equity focus. Um, in this work, um, and no dedicated work group. So our task initially, uh, let's see, sorry, um, was to define what it is um, 
we uh, wanted the city to focus on when we talk about equity in um, climate change impacts and in adaptation. And so as you see on the screen, and here's the MPCC3 report, um, for this report and for that three-year uh, period um, of study and reporting out, uh, we did um, three things. One is that we created this framework that's rooted in the social science of climate equity um, that defines um, the different dimensions of equity when we think about climate uh, change and adaptation, including distributive equity um, and, and procedural equity, which are probably the most well-known, um, in particular coming from uh, environmental justice and related fields, uh, but also importantly, contextual equity. Um, that is to say that how questions of equity or maldistribution look differently across the city in different neighborhoods. And to um, focus on contextual equity, um, the second thing we did was we invited um, a number of uh, community-based organizations that had been working on environmental and climate justice and were rooted in what we already knew were vulnerable uh, communities to join us uh, in this work, to sit on the uh, work group with us and to co-produce our work. And um, so um, uh, what that work was, was to look at each of those facets of equity, distributed, contextual, and procedural, um, through the lens of the uh, climate projections and also the social science of, um, of climate impacts and adaptation. Um, and one of the things that the city wanted was to be able to track vulnerability over time. And we knew that what already existed were um, uh, the SOVI maps, the social vulnerability mapping. Uh, New York City had done some of them, other places had done some of them. And um, so, one, uh, so the third thing we did was kind of look at those maps um, and decided that they were not always well suited to capture um, the, uh, the ways in which um, certain communities were socially vulnerable, not all of the factors um, mapped onto uh, what these communities were experiencing. So what we did instead is that as an alternative to vulnerability indices, we recommended that the city consider uh, tracking on the left specific indicators of neighborhood vulnerability that um, were more consistent with um, how communities were experiencing um, climate impacts and were vulnerable to them. Um, the three circles on this um, map are the communities uh, that um, uh, sat on the panel with us uh, that represented community-based organizations from West Harlem, uh, South Bronx, and uh, um, South Brooklyn, sorry, and the South Bronx. Um, so they were We Act, Uprose, and The Point. Uh, and we also work with those communities to, um, to come up with case studies uh, to look at the context in which they were vulnerable. Um, and a lot of those case studies um, led us up to our work uh, on NPCC4. So here are some of the maps, again, that existed, including heat and vulnerability that, again, already existed, but from which we uh, pulled various indicators that the city could instead track. So in MPCC4, I want to talk about a bit of what we're doing on MPCC4. If MPCC3, we kind of defined the framework, um, looked at uh, different neighborhoods and the way in context they were vulnerable and also the way in which they were interacting with the city um, for procedural justice. In MPCC4, we really wanted to move from climate equity to climate justice. And this is the idea that in order to um, address the vulnerability of these communities that it wasn't just a matter of mapping vulnerability or even understanding their story and the factors that were influencing their specific um, vulnerability patterns, but also to go a little deeper, which is what um, we're doing in MPCC4, and to really look at the relationship uh, that now we have a body of social science that points to between historical legacies of land use and other practices, including redlining, uh, that are shaping um, the experience of many vulnerable communities that we know are vulnerable from, uh, from the indicators and from mapping. And so one of the things we're doing in MPCC4 is to characterizing 
um, exactly um, what climate injustice in, uh, looks like and um, what that looks like in New York City, uh, particularly, but rooted in, again, a developing body of social science. And so what this uh, slide represents are the connections that we're drawing between um, you know, past policies and practices um, and current climate risk and how they're shaping future land use patterns, including climate displacement and gentrification. One of the things we heard um, in the case studies from MPCC3 is that while all of these communities were dealing with climate impacts and uh, adaptation uh, challenges, the one thing that they consistently also said that they were dealing with was displacement um, from the economic um, activity in New York and the ways in which climate impacts um, in and of themselves were of course a concern, but in many ways were a threat multiplier of the various forces that they were dealing with. And this brings me to um, the second thing that we're doing in NPCC4, and that is uh, to try to come up with not an index per se, but a score that we call that is a compounding of uh, a number of um, indices, one might say. Uh, and what we're doing is bringing together um, from the um, National Risk Index, the five kind of climate events that most impact New York City, hurricanes, flooding, uh, coastal sea level rise, with a displacement um, index, which New, which New York City already has. A local law requires New York City to have a displacement index. Um, and to add that to the social vulnerability um, indice, which tracks t uh, 29 indicators. And um, what we're doing is um, looking at, again, these intersecting ways that map more into climate justice and climate equity uh, in which historical legacies and other patterns are, um, um, are making these communities particularly vulnerable in the, uh, at the intersection of climate risks, displacement risks, and social vulnerability. And not surprisingly, um, of the top uh, 10 scores, um, we see that most of the scores are in the um, kinds of vulnerable neighborhoods that um, one could identify, but now we uh, have a sense that they're also not just climate vulnerable, but vulnerable to all kinds of uh, social and economic uh, displacement. And these include the areas there. So that's just to give you a sense of what we're up to on MPCC4, and I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Deborah. Thank you. Thank you, Sheila. Um, so, do I click? Yeah, great. Okay, so I have the privilege of um, being the co lead for the Futures and Transitions Working Group, and I'm also the, um, one of the co chairs of this of NPCC4. And I just, um, Bill laid it out for us, but an important difference between NPCC3, 1, 2, and 3, and then 4, is that 1, 2, and 3 were run, were co-chaired by two individuals um, with a, a, you know, increasingly becoming interdisciplinary, but with a focus uh, largely on the climate. And with this particular um, NPCC4, we have a panel, it was, uh, constituted of five different co-chairs at the start of it, um, and we were really interdisciplinary. So um, we had a, a climate scientist and a slash engineer, a political scientist, a geographer, an architect, and myself, a demographer. And um, that represents um, a, a transition of sorts to some of the thinking on putting the climate projections in context. And as a result of that, there's also a working group, which is the Futures and Transitions Working Group. And it starts with the premise that, you know, of course we need the climate projections for the future. The, you know, it's, they're really critical, but people live in places, and um, those places have different exposures and different vulnerabilities. And so, and then furthermore, those, um, we, those places are the points of intersection between social, ecological, and technological infrastructural dimensions. And, um, and so this particular working group was set up to sort of unpack some of that. Now that's a tall order, so we don't do all of it, but it's we're trying to get on the pathway of doing it. Um, 
Uh, furthermore, you know, we're arguing that a resilient New York City needs to be inclusive in its visions and goals, and by drawing the attention from the climate to the population at large and the interface of people in their environment really does raise issues of inclusivity and the notion of bringing all people to the table, both through um, attention through the scientific process, but also through engagement processes. Um, and so, um, and so we also need the means to like put in place ways that we can look at this over time and then evaluate how well we're doing with progress toward these goals. So um, we need to understand the plausible futures as well as the you know, plausible future climate. Um, so um, I, um, <clears throat> I'm gonna just switch to the, move, forget the second half of this. That's the why, but the what will all be shown here. So um, we asked ourselves, we started off by asking ourselves a little bit about um, how the city plans around this. And you know, the city government, um, Bill started by saying New York City has really you know, high governance and high capacity, and that is certainly true. And uh, NPCC is a consequence of that, in part it's local law. Um, establishes a real firm basis for understanding, for like putting in place a commitment to understanding this stuff. And so, um, but through that planning process, you know, we when we took some stock of what happens um, within the city, the city, like our own scientific institutions, is somewhat siloed. And um, you can see in this diagram here, I don't know if one of these points does it, no. Yeah, okay, sort of. Okay, well, you can see in the lower corner there that there were pointing out like reports by the edges of them by the borders on whether they refer to extreme heat, stormwater, coastal flooding, or multi-hazards. The hazards themselves are pretty distinct and treated in different reports. But um, so our takeaway is that, and then on the x-axis here, we see uh, the temporal scale, and on the y-axis, we see the spatial scale. And um, you know, the concentration of the, um, of the work is largely in the near term. So city and organizations are really actively involved in sectoral planning, but there is a large trade-off between both the spatial and temporal scales at which they work, and there's very little multi-sector planning. And we have another slide, I'm not showing it to you. Most of the planning happens, in, you know, to mid-century, very little of it happens um, out past 2050. But we know our climate projections do, right? 2100. So, um, <clears throat> so we're trying to navigate the complexity for an adapted future. Uh, one of the frameworks that we put forward, we put for, we in this chapter, we evaluate the utility of a variety of frameworks. One is a um, socio-ecological, uh, technological framework, SETS, which is used by largely in the ecological community and people who take a systems approach. The diagram here, which I'm not gonna go through, but you can gather that it's like a complex system is being shown there. Um, that, is a, that comes out of the IPCC's uh, sixth assessment report on their urban chapter. So this is a, a, a model that is being used in the global community. But one city really requires us to think a little differently. So, um, and the other major framework that the IPCC offers us is of course the RCP SSP framework. Again, you could argue that's not entirely appropriate for a single city like New York, but um, even the, the, um, pop, the climate forecasts, the climate projections do um, conform to certain RCP and SSP combinations. And so we're able to at least take that as a starting point and think, well, what would be required to expand them in the future? So we see those as an important starting point, but requiring important, you know, ad adaptation for city-specific um, adaptation, noting the diversity of the, of the city. Migration takes place in the city. It's a very fluid environment among people. Transit is really important in the city and or in the out, um, outlying areas. And then the um, built and housing sectors. And lastly, let's not forget the natural environment. So this is just a map. These two maps show two different SSPs of population. So just taking New York demographic futures, the easiest of all those phenomena to look at, not people moving in and out, not, the, um, uh, not population by race and ethnic um, groups, but just plain population. We can do that with an SSP style framework. This is out to 2050. Um, and, um, and, and these are two different SSPs that are shown, and the resolution makes it look like they're sort of the same map, but I can assure you that they really aren't. And in fact, a really important takeaway is that the, um, the future New York um, in 2050, and certainly in 2021, 
um, which isn't shown, might be about the same size as it is today or somewhat larger or somewhat smaller, but um, it will be older, but it might be much older than we expect it to be given current trends, depending upon assumptions that we would make consistent with that RCP SSP framework. Um, the other thing to note in this, uh, in the colorful diagram, is that um, that is going back to 1950 and looking at the um, racial composition of New York City. And it just it shows the groups of racial and ethnic composition. So the blue bars are white, black, uh, the yellow portion is black, Asians are indicated in red, Hispanics in purple, and all others in gray. This is produced by New York City's own Department of City Planning for the city as a whole. We can see the diversity of the New York City is a diverse place. We can recognize the change toward a diverse city over time. And so this, but nevertheless, New York City, it's nobody produces a forecast for 2050, let alone 2100, of New York City based on spatial distribution by race and ethnic groups. And um, those might matter if you want to study the impacts of future climate, for example. So these spatial distributions, they depend in part on the equity goals in, you know, here and now of the city, and, um, and so the patterns that remain or take um, you know, more equitable um, future pathways are something that we can address by looking at f f different possible futures in a framework like this. I have to say this work is not being done exclusively under the assessment. The assessment's just reviewing what's being done, but by other efforts that are associated with some of the resources the city is putting forward, people are starting to ask questions about this that can maybe fuel future assessments. And just to wrap up, just because of its, because of its complexity, um, you know, it, there is a need for sustained engagement and assessment. So all the questions that we want to ask or think about can't be done within um, the collection of individuals that come to the panel, uh, that are brought to the panel, or appointed by the mayor to the panel. So shared positive visions for the future are really important now in order to achieve an equi um, you know, equity and justice and sustainable, resilient, desirable goals for New York City but you have to have participatory processes. And I think we're really, even though the, as Sheila was showing, you know, threads of this were seated in earlier NPCCs, that when more was done this time, as a community of people engaged in this process, more will have to be done. And those visions will have to become co-produced and strategies can involve perspectives across multiple sectors. That work is hard. That is not the work of the past. That's really where we have to go. So. And that will engage, you know, a require, that will require probably tools that um, for longer term beyond 2050 transitions and pathways to achieve future plans for New York City. And they're currently missing. So this is, you know, we see this as a place, a starting point and a call for, for all of us to contribute to such tools. So when they're needed to guide efforts to secure a more inclu inclusive climate resilient future for all New York. And with that, I'm going to pass the baton to Joel Towers, who's going to finish up. Thank you for the baton. Thank you, Deborah. So I'm the architect, as mentioned by Deborah, in the in what felt like the lead up to a joke. Um, and I was asked to speak about the future in five minutes or less. <laughs> Um, though you've been hearing about the future from all of my colleagues, uh, uh, Luis, Sheila, and Deborah Radley beforehand have all provided views of futures, uh, climate, demographic, social futures, um, and that leaves uh, to some degree the question of the physical city um, as a space, uh, as a landscape, um, perhaps a geography. And so to speak about the future um, in that respect, uh, it, t it requires us to, for just a moment, look to the past. That's why this map. Um, because uh, New York City faces uh, a series of challenges in adapting the city to um, the current um, knowledge that we have about climate change, um, both as a matter of adaptation and the role that we play in trying to mitigate um, further risk. And so um, how did we get to the city we have today in terms of its physical landscape um, is really a critical question to understand, and it's not a place that NPCC has in the past spent a good deal of time. Uh, and so um, what you're seeing here is a very famous drawing from 1811 known as the Commissioner's Plan for New York City. It establishes the grid north of Canal Street 
um, and extends it across the entirety of uh, Manhattan at that time. Um, and, oops, here we go. Um, and I, I'm now showing you um, slightly later than that, 1865, the Veal map um, from the Library of Congress, which uh, continues to show the natural topography of the city, um, the hydrology of the city, but, be, but overlays um, the map, uh, the grid, as it begins to expand um, from Canal Street up to 155th Street. You'll notice um, the, that, New York, that Central Park uh, appears in the 1865, where it does not uh, in the uh, 1811. And when you read the comments from the commissioners um, uh, who were uh, laying out the grid for New York City, um, they're very clear about a couple of things. Uh, one, that nature is not something um, that is their concern. Uh, that uh, the natural environment of the city is actually constituted by the East River and the Hudson River and New York Harbor, and their principal interest is the economic development uh, of the city, and hence the grid is structured in order to advance that, um, and, uh, and they succeed in doing so. Um, the grid does not, for example, orient itself towards prevailing winds. It doesn't orient itself towards um, solar orientation, um, the block itself that is laid out is uh, very difficult to address from the standpoint of light and air. Um, and so uh, the city inherits, if you will, a strategy, an approach, ultimately a structure that um, finds itself distributed across the entire um, five boroughs and into New Jersey. And if I had um, prepared these maps yesterday as opposed to on Monday, I would add two more from one of our colleagues on NPCC that further extend the grid uh, into the landscape. I particularly like the second one, which is actually a puzzle um, <laughs> that, that you can buy and for several hundred dollars um, and, uh, and assemble, but it also inscribes the grid um, across uh, the, the topography of the city. And the reason that this matters is that the extension of that landscape and its development constitute the city that we have today, um, both in the, in the sense that the grid extends all the way to the edges of the island, meaning of the islands and the territories of the city, meaning that the development um, of the city, both as a maritime port, um, keep in mind that in 1811, the Erie Canal is still just an idea. DeWitt Clinton, um, who was then mayor, uh, become governor, considers the canal a critical part of the future of the city, and he was right. Um, and the city has roughly 100,000 people at that time, uh, and the grid is laid out with the idea that a million would live here. Um, we are obviously now a little bit over that number. Um, but this is the city that we uh, inherit, and you can still read even in this um, uh, uh, satellite image the, um, well, actually not because it's a little pixelated on your screen, um, but if it wasn't so pixelated, you would be able to see the grid um, as the underlying structure uh, of the city we, we live in today. And what you also see is the fragmentation of the natural landscape. We have great parks. Um, those are uh, uh, lungs to the city, but they are um, insufficient to the task of adapting a city to climate change, particularly from the perspective of nature-based solutions. And one of the issues that comes up in the uh, Futures and Transitions um, uh, uh, chapter um, has to do with the ecology of the city. And so um, I was asked to speak about images of the future of the city. What I can tell you are a couple of things. Uh, by 2050, 90% of the buildings that will exist in New York City in 2050 have already been built. So the image you're looking at is the city of the future from the standpoint of buildings. Um, what that means is that we change the physical infrastructure of the city very slowly. The other thing that we know is that the sea level rise, temperature change, all of the data that Luis was giving us means that the city itself is ill-prepared largely for those kinds of large-scale changes if we cannot figure out how to rethink this, this landscape and we think about it in fragmented terms. We do so in part because of the logic of the grid, but we do so in part because of the ways in which this, um, the, the grid creates and um, fragments uh, um, strategy. And so there are plenty of plans uh, for the future of New York. Deborah showed many of them um, in her slide. 
All of them segment or work through the perspective of um, agencies or particular areas. All of them are important images or visions for planning, but there are very few drawings of the future of New York that allow you to understand it in the way that the 1811 plan allows you to understand the future of the city from that perspective. And so one of the things that I think we're hoping to be able to bring forward in NPCC and um, uh, uh, in future NPCCs going forward is that the baseline condition, the measurement of the challenge that the city faces is to some degree about its past and what we inherit and what it takes to create the space for the cultural imagination and the spatial imagination to create a geography and overlay to this that is um, fundamentally focused on the questions of adaptation, of equity and mitigation and risk management. Um, and that city is still waiting to be imaged. Uh, and so this is the city of the future until we are able to create a different one. And I think there's a history to doing so, um, but it is one that is very much in process. It is co-produced, as Sheila has pointed out, with communities, but it has to be created at the scale of the problem that we have. And that, I think, is the thing that is um, currently missing.